in our children's children. He wants revival in households. When God gave the lamb in Exodus 12, he said it takes one lamb, the blood of the lamb, for one house, which was fulfilled in Acts 16 when the Philippian jailer was saved. The message of the gospel was, believe in the Lord Jesus and you and your house shall be saved. Not only am I claiming right now a thousand souls to be released in the spirit, not only binding and rebuking demonic power in Jesus' name, but God, I'm claiming another million souls in Africa. I'm claiming another million souls in Asia. I'm claiming another million souls in South America. God, give me a million souls in America. We claim these souls. We claim these names. We pray for the miracles that need to happen, the healings that need to happen, the addiction to drugs that need to be broken, the addiction to alcohol that needs to be broken, and the blessing of God, financial permission, everything would be released. El Shaddai blessing would be released. Jehovah Jireh blessing would be released on this prayer request right now in Jesus' name. Thank you, Father, that this oil would be as the very anointing oil of the Holy Ghost. And there's power in the oil. Lord, let there be justice, let there be healing, let there be restoration right now. Bam! In Jesus' name. Bam! Thank you, Lord. Right through the, the heart. Bam! Oh, shaka! Bam! Bam! <laughs> the mighty wonders, the signs, the wonders, the miracles, the things that we remember in ancient times that God did when he was mighty to save, heal, and deliver. We're going to tell those as praises. We're going to declare those mighty works and wonders to a generation to come, a generation that's not in evil. Thanks to the greater degree of glory. of God I mean to try to describe they say it's like the voice in the waters or the voice over the waters and it really is like somebody speaking into a microphone into water and yeah it just your whole being gets it if you've ever had a father when you know that you've done something you really shouldn't have done and it just kind of catches you off guard like Todd and it's a very sudden with a shaking and a vibration and it's not even so much did that come from the outside it sounded like Todd but it was inside and when it happens there's a presence with it there's like a fear like, this is God. The first time I met Todd would have been late 2002, early 2003. And he, uh, he was ministering in Abbotsford, and I snuck in to the back of the event to watch, to, to sort of check this guy out, you know, and watch from the back seat. Well, to be honest with you, I saw a pile of miracles. And so then I had to weigh out, are these guys, are they really getting healed? God's power can heal every sickness and disease today. And I make it clear that it's God, not any one man, any one woman, but God through the power of the Holy Spirit that brings healing. We're a non 
non-denominational ministry and organization. Theology is an important part of what we do. I believe in everything that the Bible says. We believe in creation. God created a place, a garden. God created Adam and Eve. They were the first created human living beings. God created the heavens and the earth in the beginning. The Bible writes it about 6,000 years. You know, I believe in uh, dinosaurs, and I, I do believe that, you know, the earth could be a lot older than we say that it is, but from tracing our lineage back to Adam and Eve, yeah, I do believe in the literal 6,000 years, but there may have been a time that dinosaurs lived for a period of time on the earth, maybe even millions of years, and even coexisted with man and were wiped out in the flood. Salvation is receiving uh, and recognizing that Jesus is Lord. Salvation, John chapter three, you must be born again to see the kingdom of God. And we believe that faith in Christ is essential to going to heaven. On the kingdom of God, there's a whole supernatural realm. There's the enemy with devils and demons. There's the kingdom of God with, with angels and, and Christ and the Holy Spirit and God. There's not a vote. The angels don't get to vote if God's gonna be president or not. There's, it's not a democracy. Without the supernatural, Christianity is just an empty religion. There's a lake of fire called hell that anyone who rejects the Messiah will go to a literal burning hell. There's a heaven, there's a hell, there's angels, there's demons, and I do believe that hell is a place. If man rejects Christ, he will go to hell. That's the bad news. Just start praying in the spirit. Start praying in tongues. <laughs> We believe in speaking in tongues. It's a holy language. I believe that people can be directly influenced by a demonic spirit. At times, I pray for people that need to have demons cast out. It's what Jesus did, and, and we believe that happens today. Holy Spirit, restore her, heal her from head to toe. I didn't grow up in church. I didn't grow up around religion. I didn't grow up around Jesus. I, you know, I grew up in a broken home. My father and mother separated when I was about five years old and uh, got a divorce. And uh, my mother did her best to raise me. But I remember I was always the kid on welfare that went to school that ate from the food bank. And my mom really did love me, but you know, my father left and my father was a drug addict for about 30 years. Let's see what's happening here. Let's see if we can find Dad. Is that him there? Hey! There he is. Good to see you, Dad. Hey, good to see you. Elijah's hey, Elijah. home phone up, man. Hey, I thought you were a little taller than that way. Look at your pictures. <laughs> you look great, Dad. You look yeah. younger. Yeah, a little different. This yeah. is my playground here. This is pretty nice, though. You were made for this. What kind of man was my dad? Every picture I remember, my dad had a beer in his hand. I don't remember a picture ever where my dad didn't have a beer in his hand. Before I started drinking, I did Q-Tex, fingernail polish remover, gasoline. I used to cut people's grass so I'd go out and buy gasoline so I could take it and soak it in a rag and put it in a baggie and put it on my face and just get high. My mother and everybody that was in my family always talked negatively of my father. And it didn't really matter over the years how many birthdays went by or how many Christmases went by or how many months and years went by without real gifts or alimony. Nobody could say anything to me negative about my dad. I didn't want to get married. I thought the only right thing to do was to marry her because Todd was born, and that was, to me, the right thing to do. My mom was totally deaf. 
I think her hearing had always been a little bit on the going side. And I think just after Todd was born, I think her hearing just seemed to get worse and worse and worse. And I remember thinking, is this because of me? You know, I came into the world and now my mom can't hear. The day I left, it's kind of a funny story. Was, I, I just got fed up. I just couldn't handle her anymore. And I ended up renting a basement suite. And my landlady is my wife now. That's where I met my wife. Well, I met her before because I was a drug dealer, but her boyfriend was buying drugs off me. And when he was around, probably it'd be 11 or 12, I introduced him to hookers, drugs, alcohol. Said you might as well get used to it because this is where you're going to go. I remember vividly at 11 years old getting drunk with my father. Whenever we would have Todd, most of the time that I would be working and Todd would, would be with Dave, I had no idea what they're doing. I remember growing up, Darcia was always the one that wanted to nurture like a mother. But at the same time, she seemed, as a child, to be fine with the fact that my dad would give me a beer. I thought the way of being a father, I would rather have seen him do drugs, alcohol, and that sort of stuff at home with me than go out in the street and get something he doesn't know what it is and would have killed him. I have people tell me how messed up it was. And 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 for me it just seems so normal. My brother contacted me and told me that Todd was in trouble. I was uh, 14 years old, and uh, there was a police officer. that came to my door. And there was a knock at the door. And I was the only person that was in the home. And I remember all the fear, and I remember all the panic. I remember all the emotion and 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 not really knowing what was going to happen, but I knew it was going to be bad. He was arrested for, um, I can't even remember. I'm not exactly sure. I, I'm not exactly sure about that because sometimes I, if I don't remember, if it's not something I want to remember, I've let it go. But I know there was there was other people involved with him, and there was a lot of anger. They sentenced him to I think it was three years. I can say this: I was a child that was charged with a sex crime, and I was abused as a child. And without real justification and trying to play the well, I was a victim. I had to take responsibility for many years, even to this day, for decisions that I made when I was 13 years old, but all the way back from when I was seven, and I was abused. I acted out sexually because I was sexually abused. I remember when I was abused and when I witnessed abuse. I have more memories of witnessing the abuse of one of my childhood seven-year-old friends and things that he did and said. And I remember 
I can't, my mom's gonna scream, it's gonna be my fault, it's, a, it's, it's another thing that happened. And, and, and I didn't have any real communication with my father. So it was the guilt and the shame. It was the first time I, I, I got in the shower and I, I just couldn't get clean enough. I couldn't communicate because of the shame. I was very disappointed in him, even if something had happened that he didn't come to me. The way that I really survived prison, the streets, drugs, was I knew how to be what I wanted you to think that I was, and I knew how to get from you what I wanted. I was a manipulator. That's how I survived. In my cup overflows, and I will fear no evil. For I know that you are with me, and you prepare a table for me. God chose me at 22 years old. my third overdose on drugs and nearly died. And we sit at your table. In my brokenness, in my poverty in Canada. And we worship you, Jesus. In my drug dealer's trailer, God sovereignly chose to speak table. audibly to Todd Bentley. Salvation was like Saul on the road to Damascus. I did not grow up with a religious background. I didn't want anything to do with church or religion. I had already served in five prisons before I was 16. One prison sentence was 17 months. One consecutive prison sentence was 17 months. sovereignly choose Todd Bentley. God chased me down. God sovereignly spoke to me in my drug dealer's trailer and saved me and healed me and delivered me. See, when you rely on the sovereignty of God, there's a power. When you rely on the grace of God to really pray and seek His face, there's a power. So the only thing I can say about sovereignty is this. If God was going to do anything in his sovereign grace, he was going to do it regardless of what I was or was not doing. Sovereignty will happen. So in the meantime, do something. We worship you, Jesus. And we worship you. What happened after I got out of prison? Now I'm home and I'm thinking, I still need a connection for drugs. That's when I met Aaron. This here is uh, the famous drug dealer's trailer. It's almost like here we are all these years later and everything's trapped in time. Aaron went into a direction of drugs and guns and cocaine and drug dealing. And of course, I was a drug user. I was a drug addict. So I had like this free, this opportunity to get drugs when I wanted, the way I wanted. And it became a very childhood best friends to 
hey, you're a drug dealer, I'm a drug user. And we're going to use one another mutually. So, you know, this door over here, we would come in, and I remember going in, and every room had uh, a weapon. You know, there was a crowbar under the, the couch or a knife under the couch cushion, a baseball bat in the bathroom. I'm standing here, and my first thought is, I can't believe this is still here after all these years. Just a lot of memories, a lot of anxiety, and at the same time, it feels a long time ago. I don't know why, but we ended up in this one diner. Aaron was trying to tell me the story about, well, you know, I met this guy named Wally. Do you remember Wally, Todd? And I said, who's Wally? I don't remember no Wally. And he said, Wally became the town drunk. Remember the guy? He ended up going to prison for a while. He said, well, Wally's like a reverend now, dude. He's like this preacher. And then all of a sudden, while we're having this conversation, he comes into the diner and he takes one of those Catholic Bibles, big white holy Bibles, and he slams it down on the table. I remember going to Aaron's house. I'm in the bathroom and I'm getting high and there was that knock at the door. And when the door opens, my heart gasps. Here comes Wally with the big white holy Bible. And Wally said to me, just one thing. Why don't you just, just say, God, if you're real, reveal yourself to me. He said, take this Bible, put it on your lap. And he said, open it to anywhere you want to open it and just take one finger and just put it on the page. And I opened this Bible and I just randomly put my finger down and I said, now look at the words. And nobody knew what it was. And I looked down in big, bold black letters was, listen now, listen now. I got the Bible here. This is uh, the great Holy Bible that Wally had. And uh, he brought it into the trailer and he carried it around everywhere he went. And I thought, wow, that guy is a Bible thumper. But this is it. And, and so, you know, it has some great pictures in there. It's just one of those keepsakes. I remember that day he come knocking on the door and he says, well, dad, I found Jesus. I went, oh yeah, what is this, another cult thing? And we're gonna pray for healing and revival and glory and everybody that's come. Maybe you came for a, a touch of God in your body physically. And that's what I love. I love the healing anointing. I love when the healing angels begin to move, and we love to pray for the sick. Oh, shaka Bam! And I saw Usually, the Todd Bentley has people come up and he prays for them, and he gets words of knowledge from God in real time about these individuals. You had a poisoning in your body like gangrene. Come up here real quick, please. Bam! Lord, I command it to come out of his body in the name of Jesus. Oh, Bam! There goes, bam, in Jesus' mighty name. I pray that God would touch your sight and that they would get stronger. Bam, in Jesus' name. Somebody will come up and he'll say things like, God's showing me that uh, you have a problem in your left shoulder. God's healing that right now. God's showing me that you're going to become this. You're going to become that. And I say, God, even the bones in the socket and the hip and the back, healing in Jesus' name, flow through her body right now. Can we give thanks to the Lord for that? And I stepped into the building tonight, and it was just one of those unique anointings. Listen, my first love, who gets gout? I'll pray for you real quick. Bang! 
Oh, shaka, power goes through your body right now. Come on, give thanks to the Lord for that. God, really, there's something that we can restore and open and redig those wells and release that anointing again. And so God gives him supposedly words of knowledge in real time about all these individuals who come up to him. Uh, the power of God, I can feel it tingling. It's moving in my hand. Epileptic season. Oh, shock up. There goes. Power of God goes through your body right now. Bam. Thank you, Lord, for the full healing in the knee. You're burning already. You're burning already in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Spirit of death and cancer come out of the body. Bam. I'll shock about that. His heart's going to get an electric. Bam. Boom. Hallelujah. Woo. Shock up right there. Bam. Oh, shock up. Ta, 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 ta. Woo. Bam. Jesus by today. Shaka. Crohn's. Bam. Crohn's. Diverticulitis. Shaka. Bam. Bam. Boom. Shaka. Pow. Holy Ghost. <laughs> I didn't know anything about how Christianity works. I just had this one channel. My mom, it was like this religious channel, and I would watch it sometimes day and night. You know, some guy running around in a white suit, and I would I would watch all these preachers in suits and ties. Hallelujah. Praise Thank you. Lord. And I could never really connect with the choirs and what these preachers on television look like. But I was so hungry for anything. I would just anybody preaching, any man, any woman, anything on the religious channel. Now, if you're here and anything's bothering you, you come up here and let us pray for you, and you pray with us. Oh, I just thought it was a real farce. I, I just thought this is, come on, uh, this this isn't reality. This is just phony. You know, these people are kind of like paid. Because I've seen like other ones on TV, evangelists, and I would always look at that going, yeah, this is a real farce. You know, come on. People really pay somebody to do this. What a scam. <laughs> Who knows a Melanie Rose? I got the name Melanie and Rose. Rose could be a middle name, but the word, name Melanie Rose. And, and the Lord spoke to me right now really clearly. He said, don't forget to pray for Melanie Rose. And I just command there to be a breaking and a redigging. God, there's like a whole revival coming to that side of your family on the mother's side. God's really about to get a hold of some people that have been shut down. Bam! Because the Lord spoke to me, Melanie Rose. This church I went to was really big into faith. For them then, well, now you know Jesus, Todd. You're out of the world. You can't look like the world. We got to cut your hair. We got to take out your earrings. We got to cover up any kind of tattoo that you might have on your body. And we got to get you into the church. What does it matter if I'm tall, short, black, white, fat, long hair, short hair? He goes, you know, some of these things are real. You need to burn all your CDs. You need to get rid of your cable. And now I was thinking, I'm going to go to Bible school. That's what you do. You're a Christian. You go to Bible school. And, and I know if I go to Bible school, I'm going to get a Bible wife. And then I'm going to have a Bible life. And I had the whole package, and I was going to the Bible school. And I was praying about it. And as I was praying about it, I felt this divine peace and presence. And then I heard this voice, audible voice. Go to Abbotsford, B.C. And I thought, what? I just heard God's voice. I just figured it's just a cult thing. I did. It, I mean, you get you do enough drugs, and you can talk to almost anybody. How's the crowd look tonight? Good. Feels really good. Man, they sound really hungry out there. I'm gonna write down a couple of things here. If I can find a pen. We have ushers, ministry team, the whole deal. Catchers. Catchers, the whole deal. Okay. Redemption and restoration is a message we're always gonna preach. Absolutely. But I'll tie it into my story. Okay and then I'll pull it towards the healing side of things Good. and Good. what happens Absolutely. because of redemption. Absolutely, so, perfect. And then I wanna uh, bless the city in the sense Good. of break the curse off, Absolutely. you know? Good. And then I wanna go into my message and then ultimately healing. 
we try doctors, they can't do anything. Yeah. We'll try faith. Yeah, come on. So come help on. us. Yeah, yeah, and I was just really blessed. Good. Awesome. Here we go, Thank guys. You, uh... I remember the first time that I met Shauna, I remember on a Sunday morning, you know, I just noticed, you know, this young lady in the in the congregation. I noticed how she worshiped uh, and I thought, wow, she's she's got a purity that I've never known. I still had that biker look. I still had that, that rough. I'd come out of the world and uh, I hadn't really made, you know, much change in, in my appearance at that time. And she was a little bit more uh, well, conservative. We were two different ends of the, the spectrum. He brought her to the house one day. What well, he told me he was going to be bringing her, and I'm like, yeah, right, sure. I said, this ain't going to last, because I didn't figure Todd was not going to settle down type thing, not to get married and all this here. Shauna didn't want anything to do with me. I felt I had a word from God. I felt like the Lord had really shown me in a, a, a vision. It was like a movie. I saw her in an open field. She was all in white, and it was this open vision. And I remember it like a movie, and that was when I felt like this voice on the inside of me said, this will be your wife. And so it wasn't just, wow, I'm attracted to this girl. I'm going to pursue her. I felt like I needed to pursue her because she was the one that God had ordained for me. To see her with Todd, it, it was mind-boggling at first. A lot of people said, what are you doing? Over time, she liked my gift of evangelism, my fire, my witness, my passion, my boldness, and, and really it was my love for the Lord and, and my love for ministry. I actually was in Mexico at the time when I heard it, and, and I said to, to my wife Sharon, I said, I just heard that Shauna just married a guy named Todd Bentley who's controversial and this biker type guy. And, she, and my wife goes, no, no, are you serious? I wasn't even at the wedding. I had a job. I just didn't feel like taking the time off. And plus, I didn't think this was reality. I thought it was just a little, little thing he's going to go through for a while, and it'll bypass. He'll be done a divorce within a week or something. First met Todd through friends at a meeting in Abbotsford, BC. After I met Todd, we worked together at a construction mobile home building fabrication plant. I uh, was working in a sawmill on the green chain, kind of just stacking the lumber. And that repetitive action, I developed a, uh, they called it a carpal tunnel tendonitis in my wrists. He had had three months off, I believe, with workers' compensation, and he was going to use his time wisely, and he was just going to dedicate that time uh, to pray. I remember one morning, as I was praying, and I was just kind of sitting in a chair, you know, just like this, and uh, I'm, I'm sitting in this chair, and I'm thinking, oh, I just thank you, Lord, for your presence, uh, and I'm searching for you with all of my heart, uh, and that's when I noticed something in the atmosphere, like electricity, an electric, the atmosphere, and I just started to feel like I was moving forward, slumping forward, and uh, at one point, this presence came and uh, I described this presence as like a, a glory liquid honey cloud. It was, it was rich, it was sweet, it was heavy, it was overwhelming. And, and this presence, as it came into the living room, uh, I was no longer able to stand. I was no longer able to sit in my chair. And I just found myself on the floor. Todd at times would just what he called soaking, which was basically just lying on the floor in his living room and just ministering to the Lord, telling the Lord how much you love him. There's times I would lay like this for four hours, 12 hours. I never really felt any pain because I was so caught up 
And many times I would have visions when I did this. I would come anywhere from four to 12 hours a day and be under that presence. And I learned how to soak. Some people call it waiting on the Lord or being still or just getting quiet before the Lord. And I started to do that. And uh, I said, I'm, I'm, I'm soaking. I had all this time to really do nothing. So I decided, well, you know, if I went to work 10 hours a day, I'm going to get on my face and just pray and seek the face of God 10 hours a day. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to treat this time that I have uh, like a job. What I saw were trees. And I thought, this is the tree of life as described in the garden. And, but it wasn't just one tree. It was like all kinds of different trees. And there were even flowers. And you could hear birds. But it was the most beautiful garden. And I knew immediately this was the paradise of God. It's like I was walking with God in the garden again, like Adam in the beginning, the way that it was supposed to be. And I was just having communion uh, with the Father in the garden. For Todd to dedicate that much time, I wouldn't say we, we thought it was crazy. In a way, you, you kind of like, wow, like, that's pretty cool. Like, <laughs> it was just one of those kind of experiences that I'll never forget. I don't know that I've had anything open eyed to that level since that day back in 1998. I moved to Calgary and Todd kept calling me and telling me what's happening in his ministry and, and he's traveling the world and he wants me to come and travel with him and be a part of the ministry with him. me to come over and work with him so he kept phoning and pastorizing me basically and I said okay look I'll come over there and I'll work with you I'll help you do your whatever you need me to do but don't give me any of this Jesus or any of this crap or this religion that you have I don't want anything to do with it I've always been somebody that was very enthusiastic or very passionate about whatever I was doing or saying or believing and even to this day all these years later I still get very excited over what some might perceive as the smallest breakthrough. Sister Mary was bound in chains and every link was in Jesus' name. Keep your hand on the bow, hold on. There's a lot of people in the world that look just like him. A lot of people that, and that will be attracted to him because of the way he looks. That won't go to a Catholic priest or a Lutheran church they won't step foot in it because they've had a bad experience or somebody did whatever, you know? He's just doing supernatural things. Come on! Who's hungry for God tonight? The presence of God has been awesome up here tonight. I remember sitting in the service and they were introducing this guy named Todd Bentley. They were like, this man, he's a lover of Jesus and he, he knows Holy Spirit as his best friend. And so they're going into describing how Todd has this intimate relationship with the Holy Spirit. And then when Todd walks out, you're like, what? <laughs> because it doesn't fit the, the description. The image didn't fit the description. Let there be a release of the new breed. Let there be a release of the stadiums and the greatest evangelists and the greatest healing movement and the greatest healing revival and signs and wonders. Release it, release it, release it. It's coming forth tonight. I believe in those five years, they went 72 countries. There was a few years there traveling with him where we were doing 300 to 330 meetings a year. I started to back out because I have a family and a wonderful marriage, but Todd, the energy level was breathtaking. so overwhelmed with the love of God, so full of the Holy Ghost. 
You just want to lay down on the floor, forget about everybody else, and say, God, I want some. Who came to get some tonight? We're here today, Sean and I, and we're just giving even just simple fruit today in the name of the Lord. I got caught up in it all. When I got married to Sean, I was just 19 years old. At 22 years old, I had a full schedule, and I was in demand. We dedicate this to you now today in the name of Jesus. Here we go. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Of course, I felt at that time, hey, I love my family. And before I knew it, seven years really had gone by, where I was spending as much as 300 days a year on the road. Todd's mind with zero business training from a drug trailer guy ran a multi-million dollar ministry, probably better than I know of any other business individual out there. The gospel is not in word only. You know what I mean? The whole point of the internship with Fresh Fire was if you really feel called to ministry, we're going to give you an opportunity to come alongside of Fresh Fire and Todd Bentley and learn how Todd Bentley runs his ministry. 15 years! She couldn't even sit! She had pain in her back for 15 years! She's screaming! The pain is gone! The pain is gone! The pain is gone! There is great harm in what he is doing. He is giving people false hope. And, and false hope is no hope at all. But he is telling people that as long as you have enough faith, you can be healed. And so when they leave there and they're not healed, well, I don't have enough faith. There's something wrong with me. You know, and so he, he puts a, a burden of guilt on the sick. Come on, India, pray with me tonight. I believe, Jesus, I believe. There's different camps in, in, in what I do in Christianity. That's kind of the approach I have for the reporters and the media and the bloggers and even the, the voices in the church that may have a difference of opinion. A lot of times it's not even my theology. They don't like my methodology. They don't, it's a personality. It's a, it's an appearance. It's a easy to believe the worst because I don't look like a preacher. Power goes to your body. Oh. She said, I, uh, when I was standing there, the fire of God came up. I ran across Todd Bentley on an internet program and uh, was very intrigued. So I started following him. In 2007, one of his people called me and said, hey, uh, we found an email from you that you would like Todd Bentley to come to your church. Would you still like for him to come? I said, yes. But I said, I don't think our facility will hold you. And he said, let's do it anyway. And so 2008, in April, we scheduled him to come for five nights. I thought, wow, this is going to be neat. We're going to touch Lakeland. Lakeland's a city of about 200,000 in the metro area. It's located about halfway between Tampa and Orlando and central Florida. For the longest time, it's your classic sleepy kind of, you know, southern kind of town. The economy hit real hard here. There's a lot of folks that were involved in housing uh, and when the housing boom crashed, they lost jobs. And so a lot of the buildings began to shut down, a lot of them began abandoned. Several housing complexes around here uh, had 70-year mortgages if, you, if you'd sign on for it. The crash began right before the revival, and I think that's part of the reason why the revival did so well. You know, when you're telling people if you'll just believe, you know, and God's gonna give you a bunch of money when you just lost everything, I think it's, uh, you know, the perfect storm for people buying into things out of desperation.
when Todd walked in the doors on that first Wednesday night here into our building, there was an excitement in the atmosphere. And at first, we just thought, well, it's kind of normal excitement. The building's full, people have come from everywhere. But the moment the music started, we said, something's different. started to kind of filter in within a few days of, I think, you know, the revival kind of breaking out. You know, we're moving right now. God was saturated the night before, and only let me hear for the next night. And I heard today about the angel that's going to visit tomorrow night. I don't know how or when it's going to show up, but I know there's going to be a impartation. We were hearing there was just an unusual presence of God, that people were coming from abroad and, 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 and visiting that church. So we thought, you know, well, here we go again. You know, this is another move of God in, in, in this city, and, and uh, how unusual that it would be in, a, in, you know, in Lakeland. As a pastor, we had some people who were floating back in to our church that said, I, I heard something's going on. Uh, down at Ignati Church. I began to get some reports just uh, from people I knew, pastors occasionally, who happened to tell me about a revival that was going on at, at uh, Stephen Strader's church at Ignited. And I didn't think anything at the time about it. It was only after it had been going for, I think, a little more than three weeks that I began to pay attention to it. You have to understand, we had church at 10 in the morning that would go till one. Then we had church at night at seven and would go till midnight. So we were live every morning, every night. Miracles, miracles, miracles. And uh, the glory's been on me since 2 o'clock today. It's now midnight here in Florida. <laughs> and it's been three weeks. I don't know what my name is half the time. But, uh, boom, ba boom, ba bam. Take some of that. The first time I heard of Todd Bentley was in the spring of 2008 when the Lakeland Revival was just beginning. And so I, I had a little bit of time off from my preaching schedule. And so I went down in May of 2008. I had not heard of him before. I did begin to do a little research, background research. What I learned was that, you know, even at that point, uh, it was rather controversial, that there were uh, a number of even fellow Pentecostal evangelists that were kind of wary of some of the claims that uh, he was making. The claims were familiar with, with these claims of people being healed, but I've ne not heard claims on such a scale before. We just had a miracle of a little girl that had totally broken, fractured her arm, the elbow. They got the x-ray, you can see the fracture on the x-rays. You got a little bit on the mat, she just ruined her arm. They brought in the x-rays here into the green room and you could see this fracture is totally gone. I had a tech guy on my team, he said, he said to me, he says, Pastor, he says, I, I can get this online for free. So I literally set my digital home video camera up in the back of the room with a medium shot of the stage, put it online, and the first night we had 750 viewers. The next night, 1,200. The next night, four or 5,000. And within three or four nights, you know, we had multiplied hundreds of thousands of viewers all over the world. If you need a miracle in this room, I want you to stand Steve Streeter is a pretty savvy guy technically. His decision to stream those services live over the internet was really having an effect 
In fact, as far as I can determine, it really was the first revival of its type that was really fed by and uh, grew because of the internet. We were actually watching on our computers and everybody in the church was talking about it. Todd was in Lakeland, Florida. I remember watching it on the internet and me and my friend like, oh my gosh, we really want to go. Todd had texted and called and was telling everybody like, help me come down here because it was getting crazy and a little bit hard to control. Overnight, we went to four or 5,000 people trying to get into this building, which could hold with all of my overflow, maybe 1,200. So we moved into the Lakeland Center, which is like the local civic center here in the city, and set up about 8,000 seats, I think it was. First night, we had 7,000. The next night, 8,000. The next night, turn away crowds, and it just kept building. You read these stories of, of celebrities, and they have it all. I can understand that guy. I can understand that movie star that has everything you could ever want and just can't stop drinking or party. It's like they 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 throw away their success. You know, they they blow it up. And I was like that, but it happened to be in the Christian world. try and get in. We had to just tell them, we're sorry, the fire marshal shut the doors. It was literally from the moment I got out of bed till about three o'clock in the morning, with the exception of a few hours that I wasn't fully engaged in praying or preaching or doing television interviews or running revival. And this heart, you can feel it. We just felt that it was just so unusual that somebody who I think, you know, wasn't that well known in the church world at that time in the United States could draw these crowds. Me and my best friend were, were um, house watching and watching his kids. So he said, I'm going to fly Shauna out there and you guys are all going to come together. So we helped the kids pack, we got packed, and then we just decided to go out there and we never left. It was astonishing, really, uh, the number of people that were showing up every night at this. of what was happening there, you, you're with 10,000 people that have flown around the world, and the signs and wonders were absolutely amazing. Did everybody get healed? No. But did people get healed? Yes. People were coming forward that had scars, and, and they would be removed. I mean, not just one or two, dozens of testimonies of people that had scars disappear from their body. I remember I was sitting like maybe three rows back so I could clearly see everything. This man walks up, and he has one normal eye and he has one glass eye. And Todd's like, do you want me to pray for you? And the guy's like, no, I'm healed. And so we're like, oh, okay, what was wrong with you? He goes, I was blind in this eye. And he's pointing 
to the glass eye. Some of these miracles begun to grow um, progressively. I remember one testimony of somebody saying, uh, the ink on my arm, which represented my involvement in drugs and a gang, disappeared in the atmosphere, and I don't have this tattoo. And I thought, wow, that's that's awesome. What a testimony. But hey, I like mine. <laughs> you know, don't take mine, God. <laughs> People would just lose weight. I mean, literally 50 pounds, and they would just standing in the meeting and have to grab their pants and hold them up. Things like that were happening. People were landing in airplanes at the airport, like miles away, and the second that their plane would touch, you know, ground, they would be healed. Did you see when that happened? Did you see? I mean, we were just so excited, you know, because God is just the coolest God. He wants everybody healed, you know. Homosexuals, lesbians, people addicted to crack, you know, uh, they didn't, they were just drawn to the tent. You just watch over here, you can see the lines of people where everyone's just completely laid out on the ground. Some of them have already been finished brain for, and this goes all the way around the entire stadium, 15,000 people. Like I said, this is his third round of, of um, praying for people, and it's just been crazy nuts. Hundreds of people get healed at one time. You know what, stuff like that would happen and you wouldn't even have to pray for anyone else. They would just watch that and they would get healed watching it. The one that I called was Corbin. His grandmother had been watching online night after night after night. She gets the phone call. Her two-year-old grandson, Corbin, who's in another state, has just died. He had gotten out of the house, gotten into a drainage ditch and had drowned and had been dead 20 minutes. She calls her son back on the phone. She says, you listen to me. God's been raising people from the dead down there in Lakeland and you speak life into Corbin. Do you hear me? You speak life into him. So he, he just obeys his mother. He hasn't been watching. He doesn't know anything. He obeys his mother and says, Corbin, live and Corbin wakes right up now he's been dead for over 20 minutes and he wakes up and they live 30 minutes outside of town so there's no sense taking him to the hospital or anything else you know we're hearing about the raisins of the dead and I you know I guess I've been around long enough to know that you know these sort of Christian myths can can arise you know from just people's excitement and you know, the, the story gets told and, and retold, and by the time it gets to you, you know, it's been embellished. I'm telling you right now, St. Corinthians, began to be concerned with some of the things I was hearing. And so I began to go to some of the, the revival programs myself to kind of see what was going on. There wasn't a whole lot of preaching or scripture. It was just a lot of, of kind of cra what I considered craziness. It really did sort of come to resemble kind of a, you know, a circus or a fair because there really were all these things that sprang up around it, you know, food concessions and, and all sorts of things like that. Yeah, I was skeptical, I'll be honest with you. You don't want to throw the baby out of the bathwater. You don't want to question what God may or may not be doing. But at the same time, I didn't see a whole lot of things or hear a whole lot of things that matched up to Scripture. I wasn't allowed to go to Lakeland. I just started doing my own ministry. So I had my own ministry that I was doing while he was in Lakeland. I was up in California. They were just trying to keep me away from Todd for some unknown reason, but I knew there was a reason. I knew there was something going on with Todd in Todd's head, in his mind. The 
third time I went, I'm standing in line, and there was this family that had driven down, and I can't remember if it was Kansas or Iowa or, or Indiana, somewhere Midwest like that, and they had a kid with cerebral palsy. And they were convinced that Ty was gonna heal their child, and they had basically coasted in on fumes. And they had a guy come out, and he said, who wants to be healed tonight? We need to interview you. And so they were desperate and they got his attention and he came over and talked to him and asked him a bunch of questions about the child and, and about them and had he ever walked and you know could he possibly move around without the wheelchair and just some really troubling questions. And then about 30 minutes later, they came back and after he'd gone in and apparently talked to somebody, and again, I'm making an assumption there, but he came back about 30 minutes and told him that the child was not a candidate for, for healing. And I'll be honest with you, that's when I kind of looked at him and go, this isn't right. That nothing going on here lines up with scripture, but there's just something not right here. And then after that is when the articles began to appear, not only in the local paper, but in national magazines, that they couldn't prove any of the healings, any of the, the raising from the dead that medical staff had looked, the local newspaper looked, national magazine looked, and they can't find any proof that any of this had transpired at all. I've studied this for 20 years, and uh, Todd Bentley is, is the most outlandish, just bizarre claims. Some in the media and uh, we ourselves at the Ledger tried to do was to verify some of those claims. The Bentley folks said, sure, we'll be glad to provide you with the names of the people that are being healed, and you can follow up on them. Uh, we've got no problem with that. And it took a while, but at one point I did uh, get a list people being healed, the blind seeing, the lame walking. He said that 30, 31, 32 people at that time had been raised from the dead. And of, of course, none of that has been verified. Most of them I was not able to get in touch with. Either that or, or they were not willing to, um, to talk. When you start trying to track these claims down, they never pan out. You know, the phone numbers are missing. You can't get in touch with them. Uh, they've, they've moved. They never pan out. I finally talked to, oh, I don't know, four, five, six people. And uh, the results were kind of mixed. Some of them said, yes, that uh, absolutely Todd healed my condition. Others said, well, it was better, but now I'm still having some problems. I talked to seven people. So I waited a month to see what their status was afterwards. And with three of them, there was no change. Three of them were significantly worse, and one of them was dead. If Ty was sitting here today, I'd say, did you see those things going on, or did everybody just tell you they were going on? Because everything I saw was he was incredibly insulated all the time. to protect your cash cow. And I think there was a group of people around him that were feeding him what they wanted him to know and what they wanted him to say. You had painful Six years he suffered. I think he's an intelligent guy. I think he's a nice guy. I still, th I think he's a godly man. I think he got a hold of something he didn't know what he was doing. Todd Bentley is, is, is a liar. He's a false prophet. He meets every biblical criterion as to how to discern a false prophet, a false teacher. If Todd Bentley is not a false teacher, then the term has no meaning. The people that call me a false prophet and the people that call me a false teacher, I, I know where I stand in my heart and in my love and my intimacy with Jesus. And I know that my doctrine of salvation and the essentials, we, we tend to major on the minors, not the majors. My majors are together, and those that would say they're not probably don't really know my majors. <laughs> they just know my sin, or they just know my style, or my, you know, we don't like what we saw on Lakeland, or we don't like what was on YouTube, and, and I went, some of that stuff I don't even like, that's not who I am today. It's a good question how much or what Todd believes about his own ministry. I do recall one thing that Todd said, you know, was we don't claim that everyone that we touch or minister to is healed. Uh, so there's kind of a disclaimer 
But I think that he's sincere in believing that sometimes, yes, that the power of God works through him to heal people. I don't believe that he truly thinks he can heal people. I fully affirm there are psychosomatic healings at these things, mind over body, temporary rush of adrenaline, endorphins, and you feel better for a little while. But the euphoria subsides and then, you know, there's, there's no organic healings. You know, there's no amputees growing a new limb. There's, there's no Down syndrome children being restored. None of that. So it's all psychosomatic. Sugar, sugar pill, you know, the placebo effect. So anyway. Oh, Lord, touch her and heal her and bless her and double. Oh, oh, oh. Restore and heal and new liver and all of it. Woo! Wow. An outsider to a faith healing movement, we may see uh, something that we would say, well, statistically, uh, of the 100 people who said they were faith healed uh, of certain things, none of them seem to have been healed of whatever malady they might have had. Um, but the people who actually are receiving the faith healing and those who are practicing the faith healing on those who have the maladies often have very different interpretations. Just like they see signs in the random world that Jesus is working for them or the devil is fighting against them. The perspective that we have often as outsiders is, is a scientific medical perspective. So we actually would want to put somebody, you know, with a lab coat uh, studying these folks and saying, well, the cancer actually didn't subside. My name is Rene Peleya Curry, and I'm a doctor in allopathic medicine, traditional American medicine, and I'm an internist. I went to the University of Miami School of Medicine and trained there uh, five years, internal medicine and nephrology, which is kidneys. And in about 2008, a friend of mine sent me a DVD of Todd through the mail. I'll be honest with you, I'm Cuban. I mean, tattoos and all of that. I, I, did, I said, this is so strange. And that really impacted me. And I found seven numbers of patients and I called them and I remember what they had. Cardiomyopathy, I mean, weak heart, atrial fibrillation, arrhythmia. One woman had a broken back in a wheelchair. One was very depressed. They were all healed. I said, come to my office. And they were all completely healed. And I said, this, this is extraordinary. So then I decided I needed to meet Todd. And that's when I went to Abbotsford. Right from then, I began really, I became a partner with Todd. Let's thank God for what he's doing right now. Just say, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you for the healing anointing. We just command healing to flow through your body in Jesus' name. The prostate word, I just got this word and I felt this sharp pain. I just say, Lord, it's gonna be healed in the name of Jesus. I believe that Christianity is a lifestyle, that it's a supernatural lifestyle, and it, it doesn't begin and stop with coming in and out of the meeting or conference. It's just who we are and what we do. And I think the best place for the demonstration of God's presence and power and love is to be in everyday life in the marketplace. And so Dr. Vinay is a testimony, you know, a medical doctor that's bringing divine healing into his medical practice. I came back to the office. That day I saw 40 patients. I usually see 20. I would pray for them, lay hands, declare healings, uh, cast out evil spirits, and so on and so forth. I have a bucket because the demons come out through the breath, pneuma, air, and uh, they people begin coughing, foaming, spitting, throwing up, and uh, and that, that has been one of the problems. 
I didn't come to hear a man. I didn't come to hear a woman. I came to have an encounter with the fire of God. I came to receive a fire, and I want to be a fire, and I want to burn everywhere I go. Oh! I had a guy come in. He's going to church, and he says, I have this problem, I'm homosexual. So I knew he had been abused, word of knowledge. Were you abused? I said, how do you know? Yeah, I was raped. So a spirit came onto you at that time when you were raped. In that case, it was an evil spirit and it was filled up with the Holy Spirit. I saw him after, even months after, it's not gay. It's not gay, it was a spiritual attack, a rape and implants of a spirit. And the guy saw him in the church speaking. And he likes women now. When the office hears about it, boom, the attack comes. The demons never say that word in the office. I mean, kind of a thing. Whoa, what is a demon? I mean, so it's a problem. But we do it often. <laughs> People say, get people who can say, people are going to conference model. Conference model doesn't leave room for all that stuff. I'm sold on revival and harvest. I mean, I can't go back now. Just, once I've been in the South Bar here in Florida and what God's doing, I can't go back. This is so much more impacting. The money was always kind of a key question that, you know, was who's paying for all this and so on. And when I would ask that question of Steve and of Todd Bentley, you know, they would say, you know, it's just donations. You know, they were pretty vague about the figures. In the beginning, I wasn't making any money. In fact, the first two weeks, I lost money. It was costing me more in toilet paper and lights and chairs and stuff. We weren't making any money, but we said it's not about the money. It's not about the crowds. It's about what's happening in the atmosphere. Our budget, what it costs just to run that um, event every single day was breathtaking. I had to hire a full-time chef. You know, that makes it sound so, you know, ritzy or glamorous or something. But no, we could not go to a local restaurant if you left the building. You didn't have a parking spot when you came back. You, you had to park a mile away. <laughs> Our annual budget doubled. In other words, I, I, I have a, it, it costs me a million dollars a year to run this facility. All of a sudden, I'm in a $2 million budget. But the morning offerings, Todd gave me a portion of those. Everything I did was covered. His team, was handling the night services that were costing thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars a night. You know, there were times where, where literally uh, almost a million dollars could be received in one offering. There would have to be Loomis trucks <laughs> that would have to carry the money from the meetings. And I started to feel the pressure and the weight of, hey, I needed a million dollars. People would come to me just moments before preaching and say, hey, listen, we need a five hundred thousand dollar offering tonight. And I would think, wow, I mean, you know, you don't want to be focused on and burdened by the money and, the, and, and, and all these things. We really do need a lot of money to do what we do, but we do it in faith. I'm going to give you an opportunity to write a check. If you would like to write a check, you can write a check to Fresh Fire Ministries. You can just put FFM. If you would like to give by a credit card or a debit card in the back of the chair, if you just look in the back of the chair, you're going to find the Fresh fire envelope, a white envelope. And you know, really it's every dollar. If you could give $5, $10, if you could give $1,000, whatever the Lord says, I want you to pray and say, Father, I want to be blessed in my giving and I don't want to just give. I want to be led by the Spirit in my giving. I didn't realize in the beginning the exhaustion because there's an adrenaline, there's an excitement, there's a, an anointing that you come under where you're not just a man anymore. You kind of get caught up in that. Some of the folks that would come to our Bible study would tell us they had seen him in a bar. You know, in the beginning, I, 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 I just, 
I started to, to drink a little bit. I started to resort for a time to, I'm gonna have a drink. I'm gonna have, have a beer. I'm gonna have two beers. And, and I just started to uh, compromise in different areas of my life. You got the sense that there was no accountability there. You got a sense that even if there was concerns brought to the church and the leadership at the church and even to Todd Bentley, they would be ignored. Because early on, we had decided that my team would handle the morning, his team would handle the night. I personally was not communicating with his team other than, hello, how are you doing? Everything's great. I was not even meeting with Todd. Todd and I, to this day, have never even had a private meal together. We, we've eaten in kind of the lunchroom together, but never personally one-on-one. -on -one. I knew nothing. This is Todd Bentley. What's on your heart right now, Todd? Todd Bentley has just come out of one of the greatest glory meetings I've ever been in. And uh, I'm actually kind of still trying to put it all together in my head. I just kind of broke. And, and when I say broke, I had an emotional breakdown. I didn't care anymore. And I just started drinking. And I just started spending more and more time with a a close, intimate circle of friends and people, and uh, I let my barriers down. Again, I still didn't know anything was wrong. I didn't know. My staff were all surprised that I didn't know because they had heard rumors, but nobody had told me the rumors. And I think it was God protecting me. You know, Todd is probably the most like one of those great healing revivals of the 40s or 50s, and he's also a new generation man. Come on. God, this anointing is global. It's international. It's going to spark fires over all the earth on every continent. The fire is going to spread. It's a very contagious, transferable anointing. Lord, release a little. Sika, 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 ha. Sika, 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 ha. I like the sika. I'm sitting back in my office and someone comes to my office and says, Todd wants to see you immediately. I said, okay. So I go backstage and Todd looks white as a ghost. And he said, I, I just, I can't go out there. I said, Todd, you have to go out there. The TV crews, everything. And um, he says, I, I just can't go. And he looks me in the eye and he says, my wife has left me and she's taken the kids. She's gone back to Canada. And he said, I'm leaving and I'm not coming back. I got a report from someone who sort of knew that there were troubles between uh, Todd and his wife. And that was when really everything kind of began to fall apart. I was there. I actually had just flown in from Scotland, I think. I got in a rental car in Orlando and I drove towards Lakeland. As soon as I hit the, it says, welcome to Lakeland, I felt something. And I immediately sensed, uh-oh, something's wrong. And I drove straight to the, the leadership's uh, place, and I walked in the door and said, something's wrong, something's up. I was in my office, and uh, I got a call from, uh, I believe it was this pastor in, in, uh, in, in Lakeland who told me that they had decided for the sake of the family and, and for Todd personally that, that they needed to kind of take a break. People are getting healed. 
People are getting impartation. We heard about something with a, you know, an administrative assistant with the secretary. But I, you know, I didn't know who she was. I just kind of got to give a little bit of a context, whatever you use, you use. But so Jessica comes into the ministry in 2007 and, and you know, we, we just love her and, and embrace her like a, like a daughter and mentor her. And she ends up doing some stuff with the kids and, and, and uh, we go to Lakeland. And I'm in Lakeland and revival happens. And, and uh, my wife wants to come with our young children to Lakeland and she doesn't want to come alone. Um, and we grew closer as friends. And uh, as we grew closer in friends, uh, there was just a, a connection there. I wouldn't say it was a secret. What I would say is that when me and Todd started to kind of talk about wanting to be in a relationship and considering pursuing a relationship, I would say that it wasn't open to the public. In that sense, it wasn't private, but it wasn't public. Jessa and I had begun to form an inappropriate relationship emotionally, um, not sexually in Lakeland, emotionally, too soon, and, and I wasn't divorced. And I knew I was wrong. But at that point, I said, I'm just going to love God, and I'm walking away from Lakeland. I'm walking away from the ministry. I'm not qualified to be a preacher, and, and, and that's it. I think he phoned me and said that what was going on and told me that he ended up having an affair. I think I was impressed that he finally upped and admitted to it. Um, you kind of got a sense that, all right, well, good for you, man. I, mean, I understand this thing has come to a crashing halt and, and I realize that your life is probably about to come to a huge major crossroads, but you got to kind of give the guy props because whether he was coerced into it, forced into it by some accountability board, he he, he stood up and, and, and took the hit and knowing it was gonna kill everything here. I never had a communication or conversation with Shauna about it. When Shauna found out, that's kind of where everything really blew up. So at that point, I really felt unsafe. I didn't feel like I could actually sit down with anybody and talk to them about it, you know, like, person to person. So at that point, I kind of just disappeared <laughs> in a sense. I didn't feel bad about it. I just felt we did what God wanted us to do. I didn't feel bad towards Todd. I, I felt sorry for him and his family. I didn't feel discouraged. I didn't feel anything other than I want to help these people that have come. So I was doing what I'm called to do. I didn't feel any good about it, and I certainly didn't feel any vindication by it, or I felt like, as a pastor, I felt like, here we go again, another situation that's tarnished Christianity, and it makes it just even more difficult for us to reach people. As a preacher, he was having an affair with a woman who's not his wife, obviously, and when it came to light, rather than repent of his sin and go back to his wife and children, he went ahead and divorced his wife. Todd Bentley has forever disqualified himself from being a, a preacher of the gospel. Because I was Todd's father, everything that happened in the way with Todd, it was my fault and I didn't fix it and I didn't stop it. So basically the church said, I'm at fault. I had bookings in Australia, I had New Zealand, I had England, I had meetings all over, almost one year worth of meetings. And within 24 hours, I didn't have one, nothing. Everything went poof. I pretty well left Christianity behind me. I've hung around with Hell's Angels. I grew up being a drug dealer for the HAs when I was 16 years old. I got treated better by HAs than I got treated by the Christians. As soon as something went wrong, you're down. They beat the living tar out of you. You have a biker, you go down, that guy's there to help you. He ain't there to watch you and let, let things happen. They're there to help you. And I found the Christians, they were the opposite. They stabbed me in the back. Sean is amazing. She's an amazing woman, and she always has been. 
her heart is forgiveness and move on. And she, as far as leaving her alone, her heart is why do people still carry what they're carrying about the situation? Their marriage is done. Shauna has moved forward. I needed to finalize my divorce, and that was um, 2008. It was December 2008. After Lakeland, the media, my, my staff, the world, everybody was, where's Todd Bentley? And there's no statement from Todd Bentley, there's no Facebook, there's no, it's just absolute radio silence. Now no longer is, you know, he's my leader and I'm, I'm an intern. It was like, Kate, we were, we were in a relationship, so it was peer to peer. I said to Jessa, there was never really a, a, a dating. It was either you're gonna get married to me or you're not. You know, they say tattoos are also your story. They're your testimony. Every tattoo has a reason behind it. My ex-wife, uh, Shauna, that's her name, was tattooed into the rainbow here. I had one tattoo, and it was on my upper shoulder. It was a prison tattoo, so it was done with Indian ink. So I just, was trying, I was trying to do a little cross, and that's when I was 15 years old. So that's when I kind of got my first official Indian ink prison tattoo, you know. My daughter, Lordy, and then Esther, and then my son, Elijah. I wanted their names, but at the same time, this is a Bible scene from Revelation chapter four. I got the Greek symbol here for Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. I love roses because the rose was the vision I had that turned into the fire that gave me the name Fresh Fire, so I kept a rose. That's the Star of David, and I only got one after at Lakeland, Florida, after my divorce. Um, after Lakeland, I went and got this last tattoo here on my hand, which is kind of a broken heart, because that's what happened. This is the part of my heart alive, and this is the part of my heart that was dead, but my heart was torn. That was the last real tattoo that I've got. I had a torn heart and I felt like my heart, I lost a part of it, a part of me died. 13 years here in Abbotsford, all that I'm doing right now, th th this is, a part of this died. I had to go through a healing and a restoration and a new chapter began. Restoration is a central part and I believe a basic part of the heart of God. Rick started to call me and he started to say, forget about who Todd the Lakeland Revival guy, forget about, how are you? How are you? Todd would receive a phone call almost every single day from Rick Joyner. And that was like a fresh breath of air for Todd every day, because he'd wake up and he's like, I'm never gonna preach again. I'm not even gonna read my Bible. I can't even pray without feeling like God hates me. And Rick would call and Rick would just like, pump life into him. You know, we've talked about how the first two chapters of the Bible, last two, make a complete story. Everything between those four chapters deals with one subject, which is restoration. One of the most basic investment strategies is buy low, sell high. Invest in people when they're down, and the return is much bigger. Everybody wanted on my platform in Lakeland. Everybody wanted to be my friend. Everybody, and, and this was absolute, I'd never known depression like this. Felt like he was in a deep pit. He didn't know how to get out. Tried to impart hope to him. The Lord told me one time, don't ever condemn anybody for being divorced because you'd have to condemn me. meeting with Rick every week, sometimes twice a week, for 18 months, you know, a year and a half. <laughs> Let's get to the bottom of, of, of some of the things that happened in your childhood, the, the pain, the abuse, the brokenness, maybe issues you never dealt with in your heart. And let's get to the bottom of what happened with you and Shauna. Welcome to Morning Star Ministries. 
a multifaceted ministry devoted to building upon the pure and uncompromised gospel of Jesus Christ. And we heard that he was kind of hanging around the campus there of the Morning Star Ministry. Somebody sent us a link to Rick Joyner's website, and we saw uh, videos with Rick Joyner. I just put out a special bulletin on the restoration process of Todd Bentley, and we're really happy that uh, Todd is here now, ready to get going, and we appreciative feel that. of you being here. We're really welcomed. Yeah. We feel the, a lot of love, and it's great to be here. I, I felt kind of some, some reservation, and I've gone through a real, you know, soul searching with regards to that and the way that I view, um, you know, these very public evangelists. Um, I felt like, boy, I'm not going to sign up for something like this again. I want to go and say, I'm sorry for the, the mess that I created. I want to say, I'm sorry. I'm really sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. The restoration process Todd Bentley has gone through is, is basically a, a joke. Not saying everything's, you know, we're doing everything perfectly, we're just doing the best we can. One of the reasons that Rick Joyner and others have tried to restore Todd Bentley is because back in 2008, they prophesied over him, and they, they spoke in the first person for God, and they said things like, I, God, will bring a great worldwide revival through you. Todd Bentley. So uh, I, I have to think that a lot of the eagerness to get Todd Bentley restored is to, or was to save their own reputations and preserve their own name and credibility. You know, we all have need of grace and mercy in some areas. And, uh, but we also need the challenge of one another to be real and to stand on truth. I was really proud of Rick for standing up for him. David in the Bible, he like killed someone and slept with somebody's wife and married them and had a baby. You know, it's like there's redemption in anything and anybody, you know, and, and almost every Bible character, people did crazy stuff and God restored them. That's what God is about. He restores people. I started to realize, you know, that we're all broken people. You know, I realized, you know, I needed to be more quick to forgive and to reserve judgment. And that something like that could very easily have happened to me. You know, I thought, you know, what if I was in a position like that? How would I react? I have a new kind of perspective on him that I didn't have before. I remember the first year coming out of my restoration. I didn't know how I would be received if I got up on the platform to speak and nothing happened, it went flat. We've done the videos, we've done the statements, but this is the first time I've really had the opportunity to come before the actual church and ask the church and ask the body of Christ face to face and say, I'm sorry, and ask for your forgiveness. I want to say thank you for believing in restoration and being a, an example of restoration in the body of Christ. And I want to thank you as a body of believers. Thank you. chose to have mercy and compassion on Todd Bentley. There's a lot of people that don't like it. And they said, yeah, God, why Todd Bentley? Of all the people that God could choose and raise up. And I looked in the mirror and I said, me? The big news is I'm pregnant. I didn't realize how excited it would be. We were planning on having a baby and it wasn't until I went into um, the doctor's office and I got to see the little baby and hear the heartbeat. And then it was like, oh, I really am pregnant. This is so crazy. God found me in my drug dealer's trailer and chose to have mercy and chose to have compassion. But yet God has rewarded my hunger for him. You know, being a dad again, uh, there is a lot of excitement. Just to be able to do it all over again at this point in my life, the maturity today at 38 is a lot different than it was at 19, 20. It's a first, you know? It, it, it's, it's a first for me and Jessa. To me, it's a prophetic sign of a new birthing, of a new day. 
God is a rewarder of those that diligently seek Him. And as much as I preach sovereignty and grace, I preach. If we really pursue and go after the presence of God, if we really get hungry and desperate, we ask for the blessing, it's going to happen. There was nothing controversial about his, uh, his theology. I've seen how um, this Pentecostal movement has become more and more mainstream. Without the Holy Spirit and that supernatural power we get through the Holy Spirit, I don't stand a chance on this earth. I can't do it on my own. I don't have the strength. I tried. I tried hard to do it on my own, and I failed miserably. Every time that I say, Jesus, I love you, he knows that I love him. Even before I was born, he knew that I loved him. And he already died for the sin I hadn't even been born to commit yet. And I said, God, that doesn't even make sense. But that's how much he loved me. I think that even his most uh, ardent admirers would probably concede that, yeah, not everybody who comes up on that stage walks away healed. But sometimes, you know, it does happen, you know. And that's enough. That hope is what really fuels these healing services. If you put all forms of Pentecostalism together, uh, some sociologists of religion think that it's grown exponentially up to three to 400% since the mid 1960s. It's the fastest growing type of Christianity in the United States, but also the entire world. I believe we opened up the gate and the door for the King of Glory to come in. But I'm gonna continue to minister because this is my job. I am Todd Bentley. I am Todd Bentley. I'm waiting for someone to die to resurrect me. But nobody has died in my hair or in my, or my ministry. Most people that get their inter information, the internet or YouTube or Google, all of that is a sensational, edited, it's media. They, they don't know as a man, they don't know the man. There's people that don't even believe in some of the gifts. Uh, they don't even believe in healing. They don't even believe in prophecy or miracles or visions or anything. They said the same thing of Jesus.